So, um, so today I'm going to um, talk about a long-term, uh, actually ongoing project uh, that I started pretty much when I started my PhD, that was in 2008, uh, with an amazing group of uh, uh, researchers and managers from uh, the US, Mexico, Australia, and elsewhere. And we did this uh, project, uh, doing this project, in what uh, Jack Cousteau called the Aquarium of the World, which I call it the Mexican football. Um, so, um, I mean, I don't really need to tell people here why, um, why doing this research is important. We all know that um, ecological connectivity, for example, in terms of the movement of adults and larvae, is quite critical for the persistence of populations, uh, especially against the disturbances um, that are happening at the moment. Uh, there's uh, several studies that have uh, already shown that the way we design marine reserves is quite important in terms of how this can replenish their own reserves, but also provide uh, fish, for example, for areas that are outside of, of marine reserves. And there's been a lot of really cool, uh, and this, this is really fastly growing, number of new methods and tools to, of ways of how to incorporate connectivity into marine reserve design. Uh, but surprisingly, there's uh, quite few practical applications. So that was certainly a niche and, uh, and a gap that we wanted to, to fill in. Uh, in terms of climate change, uh, again, I think most has been said um, during this symposium. Uh, but we know that ignoring some of these changes potentially will have important implications on, on, the, on the design and also the effectiveness of marine reserves. Uh, there's uh, impacts in terms of how the different disturbing regimes can change and even in ch things like changing the distribution of species. And what I'm more interested in is how these changes uh, in the ocean could change some of things like the functional and the structural connectivity and how that will require adjustments into the reserve design, um, which is um, the topic of this. So, as I said, there's a few marine planning exercises covering, considering connectivity and, and especially combining connectivity with climate change and incorporating more realistic aspects of socioeconomics, right? Because there's a lot of really pretty cool theoretical analysis, but it hasn't been done as much in terms of a sort of real, real case study. So we had three uh, overarching questions, I guess, that, um, of the project. One was, how can we adjust the design of marine reserve networks to take uh, these two aspects into consideration, so connectivity and climate change? Um, what are the consequences in terms of the cost? Because eventually we're designing these things to implement them, so we also need to look a little bit into the economics. And what happens if we don't take these things into account? So if we either design things that are not, uh, let's say, climate-proof to, to deal with the future. So we did this in this uh, amazing area, which uh, some, of this, uh, some of you here probably will know about, the Gulf of California, specifically in the Midriff Islands, which has been an area that has been identified as high priority by multiple studies at very different uh, scales. So it is certainly a hotspot for priority conservation. And so it seemed to be a, a, a good, important area. As I said in my introductory slide, um, it is a pretty important um, source for food for both subsistence and commercially in the region. Um, so it is certainly an area where these type of strategies have been looked um, as, as important to implement. Unfortunately enough, there's been a lot of work in this region, and so there's relatively good knowledge already for quite a few of the species in terms of what are the oceanographic um, behavior of this region and what are some of the ecological connectivity um, aspects that are um, underpinning the, the system. So we were pretty lucky to, to have all these things in place and enough momentum to, to get started with the project. So we had essentially four broad, uh, what I'm calling planning goals. One was the typical conservation planning of, well, let's make sure that we, our marine reserve system represents some of the biodiversity that is in the, in the region. Um, uh, obviously, we uh, incorporated the aspects of connectivity in which, uh, in this case, it was a relatively simplified uh, view of connectivity. We just focus on maximizing connectivity among marine reserves, and I'll show you what that means. In terms of uh, larval dispersal, which was quite important, um, for, is quite important for many species, and we did this for some selected species. And in terms of uh, climate change, we just focus on the aspect of ocean uh, warming um, aspects, and we saw how we could affect, how this could affect the connectivity in the system uh, under a possible uh, ocean warming scenario. Uh, 
And finally, as I said, it was an important part to think about the socioeconomics. And so we looked into how to minimize the opportunity costs of implementing a network that is designed with or without considerations for connectivity and climate change. So we looked into things like, uh, well, as, well, as I said, it's a pretty rich area in terms of species. So we did some species uh, distribution modeling using uh, traditional uh, um, modeling techniques. And we did this for about 200 rocky reef fish and invertebrates, which require a lot of uh, data cleaning and a lot of crunching numbers, uh, which was quite fun. Uh, we also did a lot of work in terms of uh, mapping, uh, checking the, the maps of habitat. So these are all the things that the uh, Rocky Reef associated species use for different, at different stages of the, of the, um, of the life. And so we needed to want, we wanted to have a good idea of where the habitats that these species are occupying um, are. And so we did also a lot of work and also work with some fishers to improve the, the mapping of these, of these areas. Uh, in terms of the socioeconomic considerations, uh, we looked at, again in a relatively simplistic way as an opportunity cost to the artisanal and the industrial fisheries. And we had about information about like 21 or 22 different types of fisheries. Uh, we follow um, uh, models that are based essentially on how much fish there is, how easy it is to fish them, what's the biomass and what's the market value of this fish. Um, so we use a bioeconomic model which actually was originally developed in, in Australia, which has been parameterized for the uh, Northern Gulf of California to incorporate uh, biophysical um, and economic aspects and estimated essentially how important different areas across the landscape uh, or the seascape are for fishing. And we combine this into a single index of opportunity cost. Uh, in terms of how we incorporate the functional connectivity, we use three what we're calling focal species. Uh, the leopard grouper, the rock scallop, and the blue swimming crab. And mainly we chose these ones because they spawn at different times, they have relatively different PLDs, sorry, planktonic life all durations, and uh, also they have slightly different requirements in terms of the habitats that they do. So, and they represent different uh, taxa in the, in the region. So what they were good, and we had obviously good information about the um, connectivity for this. Um, so we use um, some larval dispersal model based on some pretty good validation, validated models of uh, oceanographic um, circulation in the region to assess how changes in the planktonic larval duration um, could affect the dispersal patterns in, in the region for, for these three species. And we follow, uh, there's many different ways of how you can incorporate connectivity, but one, one relatively um, common way of doing it is using a graph theoretic approach, which essentially is uh, it's a bit of a ranking of, of, of marine reserves or potential marine reserves based on their potential to act as, as um, to maintain the, the connectivity of the whole network. And I'll explain this in a, in, in a bit more detail in a second. Um, so, okay, so the first stage was then, all right, so we need to um, know how things are moving at the moment. And so we did this for the three species. We described, we parameterized this model and understand what were the regional patterns of, of movement of larvae between the different parts of the, of the region and how important they were. Uh, we did this for the current conditions and for the um, ocean warming. As you can see, there are some uh, notable differences in what we would expect already. Um, and using this regional, uh, regional scale uh, or regional units connectivity uh, information, we then translated that into our planning units, which is what we conservation planners use to design marine reserves. And we then constructed connectivity matrices for the individual sections of, uh, of uh, in this case, uh, rocky reefs. And um, the, the, the the, central, the, the approach that I said that we follow was uh, the theoretical um, um, network approach, and it was essentially trying to identify how important the different planning units across our landscape are important in terms of how central they are to maintain the connectivity of the whole system. And so we use a concept that is commonly used in, in the literature about identifying areas that are potential hubs or that are stepping stones. And essentially what this means is, um, so a hub would be, uh, planning unit or a site or a piece of a patch of habitat that is important to, to maintain the overall um, the flow of larvae across the whole network. And there's very different ways of calculating this. We, in this case, tested a few and we decided to use eigenvector 
And the other one was, uh, what, what are the areas that are, oh, sorry. What are the areas that are important to uh, protect if, uh, to maintain the, the connectivity of areas that otherwise would be disconnected from the, from the network? And we use a measure of betweenness. Um, then um, in terms of the socioeconomics, then what we, what we looked at is we wanted to see how, what were the potential impacts of uh, including connectivity or not in terms of the cost in the, of the reserve. And what this graph is showing is um, how the network connectedness, so how, um, yeah, essentially how connected the network will be, will shift in terms of the cost, right? So obviously, if we put a lot, if we put like a lot of net, a lot of reserves, and they make, we make them very big, yeah, we probably we're going to have more connectivity. But if we do this in a typical way, we're just probably going to get a lot of um, a really high cost networks. So can we do it in a way that we maximize connectedness without increasing the cost too much? And that's exactly what we what we did. Um, and so in the end, so what we wanted to do is uh, to make a comparison of the, what are the consequences of following different approaches to designing marine reserves. And so essentially, we, we did this kind of a pseudo experiment uh, for conservation planning, which was, so what happens is we plan for no connectivity at all, so what we typically do today. Um, uh, what we do if we do uh, connectivity using just the normal PLDs, or what would happen if we reduce the PLD and that changes the connectivity of the system. So essentially, we did, we used these matrices and, and, and um, came up with these networks using different, these different as aspects. We used the original, uh, the connectivity matrices to translate this into how that would change the connectivity of the overall uh, network. Uh, these look pretty similar. Um, so these are the three networks assigned using the three different approaches. Uh, However, if we look into more detail of how these vary in terms of the connectivity between the marine reserves, and in this case, each of these uh, dots is one of the marine reserves in the potential marine reserves in the system, we saw that there were actually quite significant changes in the way. So on this axis, we have the, the three approaches we follow, so no connectivity, connectivity, and connectivity, and climate change. And then what happens if we design these things on the current uh, PLD or in a warmer scenario? And you can see that there's some important differences. We try to uh, calculate some um, whole of network metrics to see whether some of these differences were important or significant. And we found that, uh, oops, that uh, actually designing networks using our approaches were generally overperforming the typical approaches. And we do expect to have a reduction in connectivity on the climate change. Uh, but we do, we do found that there was a benefit of doing what we're doing. So to wrap up, um, so there are um, quite a few things that we could improve in terms of what we did or what others could do in other regions. And one is clearly in terms of the, what are the other effects of, of temperature or even acidification in things like larval development or behavior and survival. And there's some really good work going on around like that some of you have talked about, like some of the work that Bjorn is going to talk a bit later about the work he does with larvae. Um, there's things like, um, um, what about if we model more species? We only have three species. We have like hundreds of species there. Is it going to be very different if we add more species? And, and in this case in particular, adding things like winter spawners could be quite important because at some point in time, the, the circulation pattern of the Gulf of California actually completely changes. So that could be quite significant. Uh, what happens if there's changes in the ocean currents? We didn't have information to, to do this. Um, with this. There's a lot of really interesting work coming out of the center, like from um, Google's um, work in terms of uh, parental analysis, so how we can make sure that the models are predicting what we are seeing in the, in the field, and what about shifting in, in distribution and abundance of, of species and habitat. So there's, there's lots of new things that can be done. There's a lot of some, some work here, or also from some other people in the center, looking at different network metrics that can be used instead of this typical eigenvectorcentrality, for example, or maybe parameterizing population models to see the actual benefits of of the network rather than just connectivity as a metric. And just some final remarks. Uh, as I said, this was an ongoing uh, planning exercise. Uh, and I, I guess one of the important things is, obviously this network is not gonna be implemented on a, uh, in one step, like it happened, for example, with the Great Barrier Reef rezoning. Um, however, there's already been, since, I fi since we finished this project, there's been at least three new marine reserves that have been implemented using different strategies that are locally appropriate with a lot of uh, involvement from the stakeholders. 
the, there's a really important lesson to learn, which was there was always really strong leadership uh, of a local NGO that was pushing the, the process, and that made a big difference. And so it's a long-term commitment and networks and investment in a region. Um, there's been also a lot of capacity building activities. So I've gone to Mexico a couple of times to train people in the use of, of, of conservation planning software. And this is important because the network will change. And so every time we know we run the optimization, it potentially could be different. So as we move into the implementation phase, we probably will have to ad adjust the design of the marine reserve system. And finally, uh, last but not least, um, the, there was a lot of really um, long-term participation of stakeholders, particularly from fishers, from the collection of the data that we use for, for this step. So, so that's, that was certainly a, a factor of, of success. And thanks very much for being here. And this is our, all the people that, well, pretty much all the people that have co somehow contributed to, to this project and are continue working on it. Thank you.